We brought the weather, what does that do? Hello and welcome to John McKenna's house here in Tents in Tarman in Leitrim. A pleasure it is and an honour to help celebrate and launch the arrival of this fine new recording of John McKenna's music. Uh, the incomparable Liam Kelly uh, stepping into the heart of the music, playing the tunes on a flute which belonged to McKenna and which features in some of his recordings. Liam ably buoyed up and accompanied by Kevin Bradley on piano. That mix of flute and piano echoing the early McKenna recordings from, well, now almost a century ago. sweetness in that. Uh, lovely to be here in John McKenna's house in tents in Tarman, looking down over Loch Adam, uh, and here uh, with uh, with Liam Kelly and Kevin Brandy uh, to celebrate uh, the launch of, of this new recording of yeah. uh, John McKenna's music, uh, Liam Kelly at home with McKenna. Liam and Kevin, the, the music recorded here in the house, which of course is <coughs> house of music, a house of spirits, a house of the spirit of music, a uh, creative space. But Liam, tell me about about how this project came about to make the recordings here. Well, uh, from from my point of view, uh, a couple of years ago, after the, the book from the mountain double CD was done back in twenty fourteen, that was launched. The the instrument itself uh, came into being. It was sent over from from America. There's a story there uh, as well that can be told later on. But uh, a couple of years later, I came over to uh, the McKenna. Festival weekend and uh, Sean Garan uh, brought yeah, the flute with him. Yeah, yeah it was Sean Garan, and he brought the, the first time. I think that the first time I tried it was in twenty seventeen, and uh, at one of the sessions, and just like anybody else, had to go at it and played it a couple of times that night, and went back home to think much about it. Came back. So the, this flute yeah. was McKenna's flute, yes. and he used it in some yes. of his own recordings. Yes, yeah, so I, so we believe that John McKenna had several instruments, but uh, this was definitely one of the ones that was used. Back uh, uh, from mm. his recordings back at that time. So when when it became available to play, I remember playing it a couple of years in a row, and then I asked Sean about the idea of you know mm. this is a, maybe at some stage I could try and do an album on it and we could record it up at the house, see how it goes. So Sean uh, presented that idea to the McKenna Society, 
and they were delighted to, to, to think that I'd be interested in doing that. So then I had to borrow the instrument, which was, I was kind of nervous about doing that, you know, yeah. taking, <laughs> taking such an instrument like this back in the room. Instrument, I, was, yeah. I, says, I remember yeah. saying to Sean once, I says, is this, is, is it insured? Or, yeah. And Sean says to me, he says, Kelly, that instrument is priceless. <laughs> you couldn't get insurance. Useless. <laughs> at the same time, you yeah. couldn't sell it yeah. or you couldn't yeah. get insurance for it. So I says, okay, I'll yeah. be very careful. That, that kind of put me at ease a wee bit. Yes. Yeah. But, uh, it's a beauty. It's a beautiful, it really is, yeah. I mean, beautiful sound. It's great, and you know it was restored by Hammy Hamilton there a few years ago. As you can see, there is a mm. there was a crack up on the, the head. Part of the story, yeah. and all of that. It's all part of the story as yeah. well. But the rest, the rest of the instrument itself is in, I would say, pristine condition. Mm. Made around eighteen thirty or so. Again, we we talk more about that maybe later on. But yeah, it's, yeah. it's, it's like a piece it's, of history, and you know, next year I think in in twenty twenty two it'll be a hundred years since John McKenna. Recorded in the first year in 1922. So it's a span of a span of a yes. century here. And the music yeah. he's, he's been playing, he was playing back then, was already old, and here we are, yeah. hundred yeah. years later. And Wonderful. These yeah. tunes are just yeah. part of the. And the how did yourself and Kevin then <coughs> come to, to work together? Well, I, I've known Kevin for quite a few years, on and off. We played lots of sessions, stuff I've played in, in the Kelly Band with him a few times, replacing right. other people. And yeah, great. He's from County Sligo as well. and. Uh, We've uh, we've known. I've probably first met you maybe twenty five years ago. Maybe it's oh, more, least, yeah. more thirty. So uh, Kevin is uh, listen back to the old recordings with John McKenna mm. and, and Coleman and Morrison. That was all piano. So I said, I have to have piano yeah. on this. So Worse, I thought yeah. it, was, it was the best man to give it all the And yeah. Kevin, were you familiar with McKenna's music going back a good bit? Yeah. Well, I would have become familiar from visiting drum here and back in the early 90s. Um, I would have been very friendly with Oliver Lachlan, Jamie and O'Brien. So I got introduced to Michael O'Brien, Seamus Horn, all that old yes, scale. So so yeah. I met the old musicians who had um, the old style of music, so I would have got familiar through that route. Great, good, a good way in, a very Absolutely, good way in. Yeah. Um, Liam, what were the first set of tunes we heard there? Uh, the first tune was there, uh, Karen Fraser's, and the second one was the Highland Skip. To the the first tune was one of my favourites. Uh, Great, yeah. yeah. It's a big, it's one of the the big tunes, yeah. I think, in in the tradition. Yeah. So a good one to start off. Good. With. And what what do you do for us next? We'll do a couple of jigs now. This time, uh, John McKenna called them Judy Callens.
Beautiful. Judy Callan. Judy. <laughs> Judy was. Liam, there's something really special about this house, isn't there? I mean, just being here today, it, 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 there's a feeling in it, and it must have been a great place to make the recordings for the album. It was, you know, in the beginning, when, when I thought about recording, I suppose I, I didn't really think about coming to the house initially. That came more from, from Sean and from the, the McKenna Society. So when they said, oh, we have to do it, keep it in Atrium, you know, let's do it up at the house. I said, that'd be great, you know, because sometimes going into a studio can be a kind of a daunting yeah. task and you're in and there's, you know, everything is headphones and, you know, it's a very kind of a formal setting to be in, whereas <coughs> coming in the house there is, is far more relaxing and I thought it was a great idea to do that for yeah. sure. And so the history and the house has been done up so yeah. well and look out the window. That is wonderful. Yeah. I mean, if you're looking for inspiration. If you need a break. <laughs> if you need a break. <laughs> exactly. <laughs> Go out for the air and, Absolutely. and the view and the inspiration. The freshest air in the yeah. west. <laughs> and, uh, and then it was your Dave Sheridan recording as well, so you were in, you were in good hands. He did. He was a tough man to record for, you know, he kept me on my toes. Yeah. Excellent. So I wouldn't yeah. have it any other way. <laughs> <laughs> well, you need a good masterful person, Sharon. Sure. Um, but uh, you have a connection then going back a good long way. I mean, I think you were a young fella when you won a competition <laughs> under the auspices of the John McKenna Society. I did. Actually, it was back in 1980 was the first time I came out. I, I, think, uh, I think we were chatting before. I think the McKenna Society, as it is now, might have started in 77. 77, I think, yeah. So I think I just turned 16 and I came out. To the festival. My father came from Sweetwood, you see, and he says, well, come out to this, uh, the McKenna Festival and see how you get on. I'd only started playing the flute at that point, so I came out and uh, played at the competition and came away with the trophy. Tommy Wigan was the judge. <laughs> <laughs> yeah. I was yeah. breaking it in yeah. front of playing, yeah. playing from somebody like him, you know. But uh, I came away with the trophy a couple of years in a row, and that was the first time I'd been aware of John McKenna, but back then, you know, in the late 70s, early ages, we didn't have a 78 mm. player at the house, I didn't have any of McKenna's recordings yeah. really, I heard a couple of them on the radio, but back then, it's not like today, yes. you just go online and listen to all the archive stuff. So it was in the mid 80s then, when, when all the stuff was re-released on cassette, mm. Do people remember what cassettes are? Yes, that's what the McKenna uh, Society again brought out. That brought out that, I think that was 1985 or yeah. 86, and then I was able to listen to the whole collection mm. of McKenna's recordings all in one go, or most of it at that time, and of course, uh, uh, Michael Coleman, James Morrison, their yes. collections were all, also re-released. So that was yeah, a mean, it was a particular insight. time. It was very yeah, it, it was, was a time uh, of innovation and connection. And yeah, really important. Uh, I mean, what struck you about, or do you remember what struck you about McKenna's music at that time? Well, I, you see, I'd already been kind of playing a lot of it and didn't maybe realise where some of it came from. Mm -hmm. From listening to maybe Joseph McDermott and Packy Dyden and James Tansey, these people, they were already playing all the tunes that McKenna recorded. So once I heard the recording, it kind of all fell into place and said, well, that's where they learned the, the great tunes of, of their time as well. So that that whole music from this area, you know, it was fantastic to, you know, a lot of, as I said, a lot of the tunes I kind of already knew them, but when I came around to do this project, I realised there was quite a few tunes that I didn't know. Mm. And the other funny thing with the recording is there are, there are a lot of versions of the tunes that McKenna did that have kind of changed over time. Mm. You know, I don't know if that's a good thing or not. But I've tried to capture as much as I could, you know, I might have missed a few new ones yeah, here and there, yeah. but I tried to capture as much as his version. Of the original, in the sense, you yeah. could, yeah. yeah. But it's probably good too that, that music does adapt and change, and it never does, does, does. But, it, but great to hear the old ones too. Yeah, like the second tune in the first set is called The Boy and Hunt these days, where mm. <clears> that wasn't the name that was given that McKenna had for it. So some names have also changed, which can be, I suppose, for younger players, it's slightly confusing, but yeah. once they heard the tune, it's not too bad, you know. Kevin, what, what, what's the music like for you to play? I mean, is it, is it, is it a music that, that, that seems to, to me, I, maybe it's fanciful, but to yeah. me it always seems to really come out of the landscape. I mean, there's a bounce to it, there's a rhythm, there's something very special for me in this music. Oh, absolutely. <clears throat> well, like, you go back to the old days where you had the regional styles and you'd have the different um, forms of playing. Some people who play for dance music, which would be very prominent up this way. Um, other areas would be polka slides. I find, you know, that the music up here is very dance oriented and there's a good bounce to it. And like, which is the piano is very percussive. And if you picture people dancing and you're matching the steps of the dance. So like when you get a player like Liam, who's, um, it's very easy to kind of link up and get in to the same vibe. So, um, yeah, it's and when you get in on the um, just when you get settled onto a 
onto a groove it's very yeah. easy to keep it going because when we recorded just the album once we got up and going like it was just go hell for leather as all the tracks and it was very easy to get through the process it was a lovely ease in your playing together it feels so i, I think you know if you're listening to mckenna's uh, play it's very, it's very rhythmic it kind of gets that rhythm nearly from his throat you know mm-hmm. it's, it's a style it's it's a really punchy as, as Kevin was saying, your rhythmic style of music, and I think you know, the the piano already has that rhythm in it. Yeah, it's a, it's a rhythm instrument in in many ways. So to combine that with flute, 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 flute is always it's always great with piano and power on. I think you know, yeah. even back years ago, you'd hear a lot of uh, flute players just playing with the power on on their own. Again, it's just capturing that that rhythm, you know. And that that was in McKenna's music already, yeah. I think. And it was, you know. And looking at the at the great the flag floor yeah. here, and thinking of you know, too, there were a few step stats on oh, absolutely <laughs> to it. Absolutely, so good. Yeah. The rhythm off it too. Yeah, you play a few more. Yeah, we're trying to do a few barn dances yeah. this time. The ballroom set, it's, it's yeah. called. So yeah. we'll, we'll give them a lash. Just one second, again. Okay. okay. Pleasure and honour to be here in the house of John McKenna in Tents, in Tarman, looking down over Loch Allen, across at Schlievenirn, uh, and the home place of Sean Gilrain. Um, we're celebrating and launching the arrival of this fine new recording of John McKenna's music. Um, the incomparable Liam Kelly stepping into the heart of the music and playing the tunes on a flute which belonged to McKenna and which features in some of his recordings. And Liam ably buoyed up and accompanied by Kevin Brehany on piano. That mix of flute and piano 
echoing the early McKenna recordings and that echo, of course, from the heart of this house and from this landscape around us, the stunning view down over Loch Allen and the mountains around. We'll try a couple of jigs, will we? mentioned uh, the book from the mountain that the great double yeah, yeah. cd double album of uh, mckenna's music um which we may thank sean gilrain for and, and and his extraordinary work on that but sure again that again that that's part of this huge legacy uh that has been given to us and the house a big part of it this creative space and the the fostering of a whole yeah. new generation of young yeah. musicians i mean yeah. it's it's one of the really Good stories, isn't it? That it's fantastic. Yeah, I mean the 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 book from the mountain has is a double CD, as people know who have it. And uh, with with this idea originally, we were going to try and record, <coughs> re-record all of the tracks that John McKenna had recorded, but uh, we just got the first half of it done, which is going to be this album, and then the pandemic mm. came in, so we had to postpone everything. Uh, until this year, but uh, hopefully at some point in the mm-hmm. future we'll get a, a chance to revisit the second half. So we managed to get 18 tracks done for this uh, part of the album. So there's at least another, you know, 15 or 16 tracks to go. We're only halfway there as the song goes. Amazing. You know? Amazing. Yeah. How, did, how did you pick the tracks for, for this album? 
Well, I, I didn't. Uh, I, I didn't deliberately leave anything out. You see, when I came in first to record, I had it in my head that I was going to record everything. Yeah. But so, uh, but I, I kind of started off with the the idea of having a variety of stuff as I went along, rather than just playing all the reels first and then all the jigs and then the polkas. Mm. I, I kind of thought just for re recording variety and even for Kevin, rather than just yeah. playing all so the mix you know, it up. seven yeah. jigs in a row, let's mix it up like mm. we're recording the album. Yeah. And so that that kind of, you know, I didn't want to show any favouritism. And as I said, yeah. I intended to record it the whole lot. Yeah. And hopefully in the future I'll get to do that, you know. And it, uh, I, I find something moving about the whole trajectory of the music, you know, the, the, the idea of it originating here, traveling to America, being recorded, you know, musicians and the piano yeah. and the piano player sitting down, recording yeah. the music, eventually it coming back, the piano coming back, yeah. and then it coming down to us and music coming back into the house and music being composed yeah. here again, you know, people like Jesse Smith here <coughs> and uh, you know, right. you've got great great musicians uh, here in, in the house yeah. uh, and and I, I suppose that's again one of the Garrett eyes here recording that's here. right that's right um, and it's it's a, such a huge part of the, of the legacy yeah. you know, the the festival in drum here the house here yeah and the music yeah it's a whole scene and it's it's, it's like a living tradition mm. you know that goes on and started with McKenna a hundred years ago recording and you know those recordings I think everybody knows the stage that Recordings of McKenna and Morrison and, and, and Coleman and Clore, they, those when those seventy eights came back to Ireland, it did cause a whole re interest and revival in the music. Like, I don't know what would have happened if, yeah. if these guys didn't take the time out to record this music. A lot of these tunes might have been lost yeah. forever, you know. So they, they, they played a huge part in the tradition and have us play music today. And the, the whole circle comes right back to the, the homestead here. Like, and this, you know. Music in Ireland started in houses long before we started playing it in pubs and you know dance halls and Kayleys and stuff like that. So it's come right back mm -hmm. to its roots. Yeah. So this is, I mean, this is our own version of bringing it all back home. Bringing it all back home. Yeah, I didn't want to use that. Yeah. <laughs> but it is, it is. Home, but home to the heart. Absolutely, yeah. absolutely, yeah. Yeah. yeah, absolutely. Thanks everybody for joining us for this uh, launch of uh, At Home with McKenna, Liam Kelly, and. Kevin Brehany uh, here in John McKenna's house in, in Tents in Tarman. Uh, the album at home McKenna is available from the John McKenna Society and as well as the CD, uh, there's a limited release final album. Uh, the recordings uh, for the album were made by Dave Sheridan and the music was mixed and mastered by Brian McDonough. You can get the album from the John McKenna Society, johnmckenna.ie. The McKenna Society, since it was established in, in 1978, has fostered a new generation of musicians, young people who've inherited the music and are making it their own. And we're delighted as well to celebrate that heart of music and that music moving forward uh, today at John McKenna's house with several of the young musicians from, from the area. People whose music has been fostered and is encouraged by the John McKenna Society. And uh, we're delighted as well to have other eminent musicians like Michael O'Brien, Lorraine Sweeney, uh, Mick Mulvey, Dave Sheridan, Sean Gilrain, all part of, of this celebration of John McKenna and his music and this wonderful new album, At Home With McKenna.
Reels this time, Lucky in Love and the Blue Mules, two of the two of the most well known uh, McKenna tunes of Gucci Mate.
said to me that you figure without the gift of this particular and unique instrument, you might never have recorded the music. Yeah, I, I think uh, I think if I hadn't seen the if the instrument didn't exist, and uh, as you said, there's a great story about that we'll hear later on. Uh, I probably wouldn't have thought of the idea, you know. And, and I didn't think the first couple of times I played the instrument at the at the McKenna weekend, I just played the instrument, handed it back to Sean. I didn't really think, you know, what what, what, I, what could be done with it. It was only like the third or fourth time I just thought to myself, you know, walk up one morning and I thought, <coughs> God, would I give it a go? Like, would I try and do a, mm. an album on this? I think it'd be a great thing to do, to attempt. And then, of course, I had to go back and borrow the instrument and play it for a few months because it is... It's very similar to my own, the body is mm. very similar, but it's still quite different, you know, the, the blowhole is very different, mm. the, the ivory head, it's, mm. it's a different feel and with the work that had to be done on it, you know, every instrument is different even though yeah. a lot of flutes look the same, so, yeah, I think I think I probably wouldn't have thought of doing it only for the end. I think the instrument ties the whole mm. project together, yeah. you know. No, it's, it's, it's beautiful, it does, it, <laughs> it's a it, it pulls everything in. And such history, you know. I mean. Yeah. Fantastic, yeah. you know. I'm, yeah, I'm delighted and honoured to be able to play it. Yeah. I wonder for both of you, you know, what would you like the album to do? In the way that you can go out into the world, I'm sure it's going to, you know, it'll be heard in the States again, it'll be heard around the world, and it'll be heard here, and young people would hear it. You know, what would you like, in a way, to to inspire with it? I mean, it's, it's honouring the music and, and McKenna. Uh, but I, I wonder if there's more that you'd like to see come out of it. I, I remember when I was younger, li listening to 78s was something, that, or listening to 78 music was something I found difficult, even though I was a musician. Mm -hmm. And uh, even when, when McKenna's uh, recording came out on the cassettes, you know, I, I kind of listened to it and thought that was great, but it, there might be a lot of younger mm -hmm. generation who just may not have the, the attention span, or you know, maybe just the interest at the moment. I think that comes with, with age and maturity. Mm -hmm. To listen back to that older stuff, but maybe with a modern recording of the same material, is to reintroduce that material. It's it's already in the tradition, mm. but you, you'd be amazed sometimes when you're teaching, uh, teaching around the world and teaching the younger people that just don't know the older tunes because every generation brings on another wave of, which is great. Mm. We have to have new tunes brought into the tradition, but sometimes it's nice to go back, mm. back to the well and and pluck out the old stuff yeah. and reintroduce it to a whole younger generation and I'm sure Kevin mm. might, might agree with that. That's the way I look at yeah. it. Yeah. Would you feel similarly then? Yeah, <clears throat> no, I think the old music is the reference point. So again, I know there are modern influences, different music coming in, like, but I suppose we want this to be seen that it can stand up with all the other genres of music and even the modern influences that come in to the trout. So I think we have done a good job on that. Mm. Yeah. And again, all credit to the John McKenna Society, you know, for, for, for producing this uh, this album. And uh, should say as well that there would be a limited uh, vinyl edition of the album. Yeah, as well it's nice to hear that. A CD, and uh, and I'm sure all the other ways that people can can access music these days. But it's it's a wonderful it's a wonderful gift to all of us, you know. And I always feel privileged to be amongst musicians, and especially here today to be in. In McKenna's house, in John McKenna's house, in tents, and uh, with Kevin and Liam, and uh, to celebrate the, you know, this this new album at home with McKenna, uh, available from uh, the John McKenna Society, and I'm sure uh, in all good record shops <laughs> such as they are anymore. <laughs> Any of <laughs> that are left, but anyone who wants to find it, and I hope there will be many, uh, will be will be able to get it, get a hold of it. Um, and again, being here, you know, you remember so many people. Um, around this house and yeah, Kaylee has been here and you know all all the people who played and sang in the, in the house. Uh, you know I think that's enough talk. Uh, we we we'll finish with a, a rake of tunes. Yeah, we'll do we'll do a few more sets. We'll do a podcast this time. Uh, the uh, Teddy Reagan's uh, tripping up the mountain and tripping to the well. So we'll be tripping along. Good for for these ones.
most iconic instrument belonged to John McKenna. It came into John's ownership. Uh, we don't know how John McKenna acquired the flute or when he acquired the flute, but we do know that John McKenna sold this flute to a Kerry man called Joe McAuliffe in the 1930s. When Joe McAuliffe passed away, he bequeathed the flute to his brother, John, and then when John passed away, he bequeathed the flute to his son, John. And when we were doing the book from the Mountain Project on John McKenna, the, the definitive story on McKenna, both musically and biographically, John McAuliffe heard about this project going on. And we got in touch with McAuliffe through, through the offices of Hammy Hamilton, the flute maker. And John McAuliffe gave the flute to the John McKenna Society. A uh, wonderful gesture. Now, the, the flute's provenance, even though the flute is unstamped, the, the flute's provenance is definitely American. Now, a few things point to that. It's a rudel and rose design with a cocos wood body with an ivory head, and the workmanship points towards the workshop of Jabez McCall Camp or his partner, Asa Hopkins, who are based in Litchfield in Connecticut, between circa 1829, 1829 and 1839. And um, the rib bargle, the rudel and rose design, the ivory head all points towards uh, the fact that these makers probably made the flute. I got in touch with John and, and John said that the flute had been in an attic for 25 years and it needed a good bit of repair to get it back into a playing condition. So I said, look at John, what about sending the flute over to Ireland here and, and maybe we could try and get it restored in time for the launch in June 2014, the, the book from the mountain launch. And John was delighted with that, and he says, he said, you know, what, what, what about Hammy? He says, you know, he, that's the man I'd want to restore it. So I got in touch with Hammy. Hammy said he'd be delighted to restore the flute. And uh, so the flute was sent over from America, straight to Hammy, um, upstate New York, where John McAuliffe lives, straight to Hammy's office in, um, in Coulee, in West Cork. And um, Hammy restored the flute to full play and condition. It was no mean feat because there was a full crack across the embouchure hole. The flute was unplayable, really. And because it was John McKinnis' flute, it has to be said that uh, Hammy's generosity was such that he took no money for the restoration of this instrument. And then not only that, but he, he hand-delivered it up to the to, to, to Drunk Hearden in time for the launch in June 2014. We had a fantastic night. And then when the launch was over, Hammy took the flute back to Cork would have you to post it back to America to John McAuliffe. But then the hand of fate intervened in, in the form uh, that uh, um, Hammy rang me and said, Sean, I don't think this, we better contact John McAuliffe because there could be a bit of aggro now getting this route back to America. Uh, it seems that the, the ivory laws which had existed to curb the sale and transportation of ivory, those laws had, be, had, be, had been tightened up in the, in the last, in the, in, 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 the, in the few months before the launch. The flute came over to Hammy's um, workshop in November 2013. And uh, six months later, in, in, in um, six, seven months later, in June 2014, we were going to post the flute back to America. So it was only, the flute was really only in Ireland for six, seven months. And in, the, in, the, in, in, in that seven months time frame, the, the laws had been tightened up. Um, uh, these ivory laws, such that we couldn't we couldn't take the risk of posting this flute back to America now, in case U.S. Customs would confiscate it when they see the ivory head on it. So we contacted, I contacted John McAuliffe with a heavy heart about this, and John said, "Sean, I think, you know, this is fate, it's destiny. That flute, even though it probably never was in Ireland before, should now stay in Ireland. We can't take the risk of, of sending it back because of the ivory head." So he, he, there and then he permanently donated the flute to the John McKenna Society. What a wonderful gesture. And uh, the rest is history. So that's the story of this most iconic instrument.
Yeah. You found it all as you, you give me a bit of advice. I headed for London when I was 17. I left Ballinagara Mountain over there when I was 17. And the last thing my father said when I left to head for Hollyhead was, if you can get in, he said, the best thing you could do when you head for London, he says, get in with a rich woman with a bad heart. <laughs> How did that work out for you? <laughs> neither, neither. You, you, you got the bad heart first. Though. You got in with a lot of men with bad hearts and bad livers. <laughs> the hang of the money. 